Okay, that was a joke. Uh, my name is Nick Molnar. I am from the United States. I live in Austin, Texas. And so you already know a couple of things about me because I'm American. I'm fat. It's true. We're all fat. Uh, I'd like to visit your country. I appreciate you guys having me here and the organizers having me here. But I have one bad problem as a fat American when I'm in England, and that's eating. Because you guys don't call anything by the right name. You have these spongy purple vegetables that you call aubergine. I'm here to tell you that this is eggplant. Uh, you have things that I really like. They're delicious and sweet. I have them after my meal and before my meal sometimes. You call them pudding, and they are dessert. Uh, my mom used to make me eat these uh, nasty courgettes, which are actually zucchini. You have more pudding, which I call bread. Uh, you have rocket. I eat arugula, aru, uh, arugula. And the winner for the most overloaded term in British, British ease, once again, you have pudding, <laughs> which I call sausage. You have some other things that you guys like to eat here. <laughs> Seriously, I could not order this with my mother at the table. She would, she would be offended. So uh, let, let's, let's kind of dig in a little bit with what we're here to actually talk about, which is creating better applications and faster. And I kind of feel like my session is uh, a really good one to end because it's, it's a bit of a culmination of a lot of things that all the other speakers said. There were a bunch of great presentations, um, except for uh, uh, Maisie, who had that Microsoft chart. I don't know what that was all about. I mean, our guns are way bigger in the States. <laughs> So, um, no, but what I do want to do is I, I want to I turn the attention away from us, the developer, and talk about why we do what it is that we do, and more importantly, who it is that we do that for, and that's our users. A couple of weeks ago, this is a true story, my daughter turned two years old, and so we took her to Disney World. I'm a big fan of Disney World. One of the things that I really admire about Disney World is when you visit Disney World, you are never called a customer. You are a guest. And the way that they approach that, even to the term that they use to refer to their users, changes their mindset for how they make sure that their users are having a good time. And so I, I kind of like to think of the users of my software as my guest, and how would I treat them differently if I thought of them that way? So in 1943, Abraham Maslow was a psychologist. Uh, he published this theory called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Right? We're probably all familiar with the triangle. We learned about it in grade school. Right? This is a series of steps that have been prioritized that say that these are the things that human beings need to grow and to thrive and flourish. Well, a few years ago, a gentleman in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, uh, by the name of Aaron Walter, who's a UX director at MailChimp, proposed a very similar idea for our guests, for users of our software. And there's four fundamental things that they need, and the fifth one, which is the summit, that we're all aspiring to. So first of all, when we create software for our users, we have to make something that is functional. It has to solve a problem that they have. And we've seen a lot of problems and a lot of ways that they've been solved with the, the speakers previous to me. Next, that software needs to be reliable. It needs to solve the same problem the same way every time. I'm a big fan of Twitter. You can tweet me anytime you want to at nikmd23. But a few years ago, the fail whale became a national celebrity in the United States because Twitter was not reliable ever. They were more known for their failures than uh, from their, the, their reliability. Uh, next, applications should be usable. They should be easy for our guests to figure out how to use and remember how to use when they return to them. And then the fourth one is performant, which I actually kind of grouped together with usability, but I am not like Graham. I can't do like really cool, responsive, squeezy things. Um, and so I get to focus a little bit more on performance as an engineer. Uh, that's kind of hard math and science. But once we get through these first four phases, we get into being able to finally build software that is pleasurable, something that our users actually desire to use. So what I want to do for the remainder of this uh, 40 minutes that I have in my session <laughs> is um, two times. I won't do it a third time because then I shouldn't get any laughs three times. Uh, what I want to do is I want to uh, kind of talk through some of my thinking and Microsoft's thinking for how to help developers like yourselves build more functional, reliable, usable, and performant applications. And so um, 
I work on, on the Node team at Microsoft. I'm focused on Node Diagnostics. So what I kind of want to do is show you some really early thinking and some experiments that we're playing around with that will uh, hopefully help you. Uh, so first, let's go ahead and dig into functional software. Uh, to do that, I'm going to run a little demo. Uh, I have, uh, just like the Infogistics guys, taken a web app and I've converted it into an open fin app. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to build that app and we're going to start it. And then as soon as that's ready, we're going to go ahead and uh, launch it in open fin. Oh, you guys didn't tell me I had something go wrong. Ah, NPM run, it should be NPM start. There we go, server's running, and now I'm going to launch my app. <laughs> I can stand the silence. We're going to do some quick debugging here. Let's see what's going on. <laughs> Pay no attention to the error you see. There we go. Now it's working. All right. I don't know what happened there, but we got it going. So this is a sticker app. Uh, it's a little e-commerce app. It's kind of like Sticker Mule. You can go in there and buy your favorite open source uh, logos, and we print them out and send them to you as stickers. Just uh, hand me five pounds and uh, I'll get it to you, I, I promise. Um, and so this is a, a great little app, but uh, one of the pieces of functionality that a user needs for the thing to be functional is they'd like a way to close it. Um, and I, I haven't built that feature. So uh, let's go ahead, I'm gonna force close it down here, and we're gonna take a look at how Microsoft can maybe help you build some functionality. So I'm gonna open up VS Code. This is our cross-platform editor that's uh, really great for JavaScript. And Sticker App is built in React. So I'm simply gonna go ahead and uncomment this uh, close button that I have here in my, com on my, uh, in my component. And uh, when somebody clicks on that, we're gonna run this onClose clicked method that has no implementation on it yet. I wanna point out one thing real quick. I have installed this types slash openfin module from NPM. This is going to give me TypeScript file definitions for OpenFin. Now, I'm not actually even using TypeScript. I just added this in from NPM. This is just a regular old JavaScript file. And so, but because I've done that, now when I type in fin dot, I actually get code completion. And so I don't, I do know a ton about um, OpenFin, but go with me, right? This is, this is the theater. Uh, I'm gonna come down here to uh, <laughs> desktop, dot window dot hmm how do I get the window oh get current that sounds pretty good good naming guys uh, dot close great and just like that I was able to have support to walk me through exactly how to use an API that I don't have a lot of familiarity with if I uh, fat fingered it because I'm American um, I get these little squigglies that tell me, hey, I did something wrong. And with a couple more seconds of configuration, I could actually uh, have this break my build. Uh, we won't do that. Instead, we're going to go ahead and save. I'm going to rebuild and start this app again. We have the new version of the app. And server is going to run now. Now. There we go, and we'll run our app again. And just like that, I have this cute little close button that's absolutely functional. Thank you! <laughs> I'm so pandering. Uh, so that's functional software. The next phase on, on the pyramid is reliable software. And so, as the diagnostics guy, I, I like to think of, of reliability in two different veins. The first is when you're in production and something inevitably bad happens, that oh crap moment. And what you're trying to do is fix it under a lot of pressure from your boss or your users or your bank accounts or all of the above as fast as possible. And so the metric that we use to measure how quickly you can fix these kinds of failures is called mean time to recovery. 
Now, as we were talking to JavaScript developers about how they like to solve their problems, there was an overwhelming trend that I saw, uh, and it was also uh, seen in the rising stack survey of a couple thousand uh, JavaScript developers. How do you debug your applications? Overwhelmingly, console.log is the state of the art in JavaScript. Now, there are other things. There are plenty of debuggers. Actually, VS Code has a great debugger. If I pressed F5, it would just be running. But because this is where JavaScript developers are comfortable, we wanted to make sure that we can meet them where they are. Now, this is a whole section about reliability. The internet here, not so much on reliability. Uh, so I have pre-recorded the next couple of demos. So here I am uh, running AZJS logs. This is going to give me a tail of the application running in production on Azure. And so now any requests and any logs that happen on that app live will stream down to me on my dev box. I'm going to go ahead and launch the app again, this time overriding the URL to point at my production server at Jovial Detail. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do a search on Flickr for another sticker for Rocket. These are spaceships. This is what rockets really are, guys. They're not salad. <laughs> oh, but here's the problem. That kind of happened really slowly, and I don't know why. Those images feel like they're slow. Oh, man, I just need a little bit more logging information on production. So typically, I would have to redeploy my app to do that. Well, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this little AZJS experiment of ours. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a cat command passing in the path to a file on my server. Right here in my console, I get dumped out with syntax highlighting that file. This is the file that's serving up that, that Flickr request. And I'm going to look here on line 33. I actually see the response that's coming back from Flickr. I want more information in my logs from there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask AZJS to add a log point to that same file. I'm going to do it on line 33. And I'm going to pass in any random log expression that I want to. In this case, I'm really interested in seeing what the headers are that I'm getting back from Flickr. So I ask for response.headers, and I add that log point. What happens when I hit enter there is I've literally injected a logging statement into the live running app without stopping it, restarting it, or redeploying it. So now when I rerun the app and I go back to Flickr, and I do a search again for Rocket, which for some reason this time I don't get NASA. I get, Gar oh no, no, another demo later turns into Guardians of the Galaxy. But you can see over here on my, on my logs on the top, I see all of the headers for that request, and I can see there's my cache control. And no wonder why it's slow. They're explicitly not letting me cache any of the images. And so this little log points experiment that we're running right now is uh, something that we think will help you uh, reduce your mean time to recovery. Interesting? I like hooting and hollering, but I'll take yes. You guys are so demure. <laughs> so um, the other vein that I think about diagnostics in is uh, the opposite problem. This is you have a problem in production. How are you going to fix it as fast as possible? The other thing is, is why don't we just uh, stop the bleeding before it starts? And uh, when you deploy something to production and that deployment has a failure, you either have to roll back or do a hot fix or something like that. That's called a, um, a change failure. And so the metric that's used to watch that is change failure rates. And so we want to keep change failures low because that's how we can increase our reliability. And so there's another tool that we're doing some experimentation with that is called Project Glimpse. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to run the same app again. Once again, reliability problems. And so you might notice down in the bottom corner of my app, I have this little open and glimpse thing. We'll take a look at that in a moment. On this page, I've actually logged out the monitor information that OpenFin gives me. I'm sure Rich over at TT uses this object all the time to figure out where he can put his bajillion different windows. Um, but that's great that I can see that in Chrome DevTools with OpenFin, but, in, but I also have to go and look at my server-side logs in that console. So I'm going to pop open Glimpse. I'm going to go to the Logs tab. And what I see here is a unified view of both my client-side logs. You can see me here looking at the primary monitor, but also the same server-side logs of that same request. And here's my render values that I saw in Express. And I can do all the standard filtering that I want to. So this is truly a full-stack tool bringing together server-side logs, client-side logs all together as one. We think of Glimpse as an auto-logger. You'll never have to write log statements again because all the places where you would want them, we do it for you and present it in a much better graphical tool. So once again, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do a search for Rocket. Uh, this time, I get Guardians of the Galaxy, not NASA. And I'm going to switch over to that request in Glimpse. Now, if I click on Web Services, I don't even need log points when I'm doing this locally because I can see the request to Flickr. I can see that exact same cache control header that's not allowing me to cache anything. But I have full information. I can actually see the body that was sent back from Flickr. I don't have to do anything for this to work in my application. I npm install a package, and I'm good to go. 
Uh, I can also go and look at the original request, the main request that came into my server. I can see the headers. I can drill in and I can see the body, the cookies, anything that you would expect to be able to see from any HTTP uh, sniffer, and I can drill into all of that. And then, wait, there's one more. Come on, pass Nick, catch up. Uh, I can take a look at all of the middleware that ran for that given request in the order it ran and what it did to the response. So you can see here number seven set the status, oh, no, not anymore, too bad. <laughs> and then I also have a profiler built in that is showing me everything that happened on that request. And we can see that big purple line at the bottom. That was my service called a Flickr. That is what's taking up the bulk of the time for that request. So a lot of power uh, for you to make sure that you don't have as many failures when you deploy. The next thing on the pyramid was usable software. Uh, this is where I really think that OpenFin uh, fits in really well. Uh, because what I see that OpenFin has done is they've addressed your market and really looked at some of the usability concerns that those users have. That, that your users have, and they want to solve those, right? So we, we've seen amazing windowing and charting and interoperability, right? They give you security, because that's obviously very important in a banking world. Uh, they do that by uh, using the Chromium sandbox, which is like the best sandbox that's available as far as web content goes. And then they, they extend things like group policy, so it plays well in your enterprise. Uh, they don't force your users to throw away everything that they had. Like, I know Rich rebuilt his whole app because Rich is amazing, but uh, a lot of people, like myself, are not that amazing. And so we want to use some of the old tech and the new tech, uh, and they make that interoperable. Uh, the deployment is easy because it's the web, and that's the web superpower. And the ecosystem is amazing. Like, I didn't do anything special to my OpenFin app. Log points just worked. Glimpse just worked. All of this technology that we get from Node and we get from the JavaScript browser community just works because we're playing in such a rich, uh, well-established ecosystem. Now, a lot of these things we've been talking about as developer experience and tools to help you as a developer, and they do do that, but they show themselves to the user. So we're gonna go from developer experience to user experience, because users need secure applications, otherwise it's not reliable. They want interoperability because that helps them with their usability. Uh, they like having instant deployment so they're not sitting there on their app store hitting update every single night on the hamster wheel like I have to do. So Microsoft has some stuff to help you with usability as well. There's an inclusivity uh, design toolkit. I'm not a designer, right? I'm not Graham. Uh, I find this thing to be really, really helpful. It walks you through some accessibility guidelines, how to, to make sure that your app is usable for everybody. And um, they have this really good example where it's like, well, you can think about building your app for a person who's maybe come back from war and unfortunately lost a limb, right? But that person is fairly in the minority. Uh, but there's a lot of people who are like my wife who only can use one hand because she's holding on to our baby all the time. Uh, and, and there's other people who maybe just uh, broke their arm. Right? And so the idea is that when we think about accessibility, we think about uh, people in wheelchairs or people who can't see. But there's a whole spectrum there. And if you make an app that works for those maybe extreme cases, it helps a lot of other people in a lot of other situations. And then uh, we also have this Fluent Design Toolkit. Uh, Maisie talked a little bit about um, using CSS style guides. Fluent is Microsoft's newest one. We just announced it a couple of weeks ago. It's very similar. It deals with these five different elements of light, depth, motion, material, which is kind of a texture, and scale. And so I have resources available for you at the end of the session uh, if you would like to look into that. Uh, so we're going to take the, the next step up the pyramid and look at performance applications. I see performance as part of usability because we all know like when we, we open up that app and it goes super slow, we're like, we get frustrated, right? Same way that we get frustrated if you can't right click something you were supposed to right click. And so um, at Microsoft, we have an application performance monitor called Application Insights. And so I'm going to use AZJS again just to say AZJS monitor that will automatically Look at the directory that I'm in, know where that app lives on Azure, open me up and take me straight to all the charts and dials so I can drill in and I can see all the requests that were made to my server. Excuse me. I can drill in on their performance. I can do all the filtering and stuff that you would expect to be able to do from a mature and rich APM product. Uh, so in this case, I'm looking at those searches that I made, like when I was searching for Rocket against Flickr. Um, I can drill in on a specific time frame. I see there was a lot of requests that happened uh, yesterday in the afternoon. This one particular request was slow at 766 milliseconds. So I'm going to click on that. I can see more details 
Here's that dependency, the call that went to Flickr. It wasn't Flickr's fault in this case. They only took up about a third of the time. I have another 500 milliseconds that I need to account for as a developer. Uh, and then Application Insights does a bunch of other things. I'm going to kind of step back to the beginning of App Insights here, and we're going to drill in, and we'll take a look at the application map, which gives you a visual of how your app is uh, put together. Uh, my app is very simple. There's the web front end, and that calls out to Flickr. Uh, but my web front end has a failure 4.3% of the time. I never uploaded my fave icon. And so there's been a bunch of different errors for that, and I can drill in, and I can see those errors and when they happened and who they happened for. So that's it. With those four things, we've kind of got to the point now where we're no longer thinking about, you know, is the bed made and are there clean towels for my guest? It's how can I make sure that they have a good time when they're visiting my home? And so, you know, Disney gave us this concept of having a guest. And I really want to encourage you guys to think about who you're building for and to make sure that everybody can have a pleasurable experience. Uh, if you want to chat with me, I'll be hanging out in the booth over there, or we can always chat on Twitter. Uh, thank you guys so much. You guys were great, and I was awesome. <laughs>